This video is an introduction to a topic that I love, organizational learning. Uh, this was the subject of my dissertation, and this um, topic has really transformed my view of, of the world, really. I consider myself a lifelong learner, so I have adopted some of these principles at an individual level. It's taught me how to think, uh, I believe, and I want to convey these ideas to you and let you decide for yourself. We will be tested on this. You will have 10 questions on a test uh, related to this material, and I hope that you find it as interesting and fascinating as I do. Uh, there's a real simple story uh, of, of my grandmother, and my grandmother understood this concept pretty well. She valued learning very well. She um, uh, did not have a college degree, and neither did her husband, but, you know, and you know, I was, I was talking to her what I, about what I was doing. I was on my way to getting uh, a PhD, which was unheard of in my family. Uh, so I'd had two master's degrees, uh, an undergraduate, and was getting my PhD. Spent my 20s in school. And we was just talking about what I was doing. And she goes, you know, I could have gotten my doctorate. And she said it would have been easy. And I said, really? How? And she said, study. It was just one simple word. She said she would have just studied. She would have worked hard and learned. You know, and learning is difficult and arduous. And it's very simple. But there's an entire science of learning, and we now uh, apply it to organizational learning. It's a big topic. Um, it's still a very popular topic in uh, management discussions. The reason we study organizational learning in this class is because there's not any information technology that does not support organizational learning. Uh, and, and organizational learning is an information processing view of the organization. So my view is that if we understand organizational learning better, we can understand our organizations better, in particular, how they should operate to sustain competitive, competitive advantages. So I hope you enjoy this topic as much as I do. To best understand organizational learning, we should understand the, the evolution of organizational thought throughout history. I've organized uh, organizational thought into two broad eras. The first is the hierarchical era. And uh, if you look on the bottom right of the screen, uh, you'll see a picture of, a, of an Egyptian pyramid. And this is a good symbol for representing hierarchy. Uh, and it's used in management literature, actually. If you look above the word hierarchy here, the, the green triangle uh, is, is uh, it looks like a pyramid as well. And so that's what they use to uh, signify hierarchy. And interestingly, the pyramid on the bottom in Egypt was built with a tremendous amount of hierarchy. They believe it was built with slave labor, uh, complete top-down control over people, a lot of tremendous uh, labor as well as a lot of people involved. It's a mystery as to how this was built without incredible backbreaking uh, labor. There are only theories as to how that was done. But uh, as you see in, in the uh, management uh, hierarchy seen in the Green Pyramid, this was something that was actually published by Robert Anthony in 1965 in the book that you see on the left hand side. The pyramid published by Anthony is a framework for understanding organizations. It holds that strategic management is at the top of the organization. Of course, uh, the top of the organization is smaller than the bottom. At the bottom of the organization is what we call operations management. And in the middle is tactical management. So it's three layers of management. And of course, it's very simple to think about this, that the few strategic managers will tell the tactical managers what to do. And the tactical managers will tell the operations managers at the bottom what to do, and information will flow from operations uh, all the way up to the strategic level through the middle managers. And so um, middle managers have the job of uh, conveying uh, ideas and thoughts and uh, information, facts from operations to strategic management, and strategic management would tell the tactical managers in the middle of the organization how to carry out plans, and you know it's just a good uh, way of depicting hierarchy in organizations using a pyramid. And again, the, the Egyptian pyramids were uh, coincidentally developed using the same kind of hierarchical thought. So this is the first era of organizational thought, hierarchy. Hierarchy has been around for centuries. We see hierarchy in education. 
you have a provost, and under the provost you have deans, under that you have department heads, under that you have teachers, under that you have students, and you know, so we see hierarchy in uh, medical professions. We have surgeons. Surgeons tell other people what to do during the surgery because they are ultimately, re ultimately responsible. Uh, you see this in military. You have generals. You know, you have, you have lieutenants, colonels, sergeants, and all the way down to the bottom where we have the, uh, the operational level, level where you have troops, uh, you know, and I don't know all the terminology for the classifications, but unquestionably the military uh, functions depending on hierarchy. Uh, in fact, uh, without following orders, a lot of um, uh, people may get killed. So it's uh, essential in military. Um, in addition, families are operate through uh, hierarchy. They have to. When you're a small child, you don't tell your parents what to do. Um, so we, we can all kind of relate to this. So hierarchy is all around us. It's wonderful in certain situations when you have to uh, have act, uh, you know confirmed results in a short time period. It's essential, and we still have hierarchy today, but it's not the only way to function. And so that brings us to the next uh, era in organizational thought, and that is what I call the quality revolution. It's a very broad term. Uh, it was was um, brought about by several people, but probably most notably by W. Edwards Deming. Deming was an analytical guy. He was an engineer, statistician, professor, author, lecturer, and management consultant. He was able to bridge analytics, uh, a systems view, with management. Uh, he was educated initially as an electrical engineer and later specialized in mathematical physics. Uh, he's also known uh, as, as a pioneer in sampling techniques with the uh, U.S. Uh, Census, Department of Census, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So Deming understood statistics very well. He understood how they apply to real-world situations and uh, through his efforts in promoting uh, quality initiatives he is uh, now viewed as a, a pioneer and a revolutionary um, thinker in the area of management. So we'll learn more about him. The thing that probably launched uh, Deming's fame more than anything was World War II. As you look in these pictures, you can see uh, the aftermath of atomic bombs being dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, Japan. This is very devastating uh, to look at. It's um, tragic in a lot of ways. And this, I don't want to get into the history of World War II and war and all of this, but I think it's uh, important to note that, as you can see clearly, the industrial base of Japan was damaged greatly from this. And, uh, you know, this was the heart of the industrial center of Japan. And uh, so after World War II, Two, Japan being decimated as it was, needed help. They needed consultation on how to organize this industry. They could not have a military anymore, so they had to reorganize and to rebuild their industry. They listened to consultants, and one of the consultants they listened to was this American, W. Edwards Deming. So they brought him over. He told them about his philosophies, and we'll talk more about his philosophies in a minute. And to make a long story short, today, Deming is um, lauded at, at Honda Corporation. In fact, on the CEO, in the CEO's office, he, his portrait is on the wall with two others, and his is the largest and in the middle. The others are the founder of Honda as well as the current CEO. So Deming, even today, is revered in Japan. And I'm going to describe a little bit more about how that came about. I'm going to describe the philosophy as I see it in a few minutes. If you want to learn more about Deming's philosophy, you can read one of his two books. One is The New Economics and the other is Out of the Crisis. Based on these books and his consultation, Deming is credited 
with the post-World War II Japanese economic revival. And of course, there are the two books. He, he also is credited with the, a system of profound knowledge. I will touch on that in just a minute. He also has 14 points for managers. And as you see on the top right hand side, people thought enough of this, uh, f these, these points that they applied them to education for students. So how can students um, use his philosophies to do well in school? We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. I'll try to bridge his thinking to what you're doing as a student. And also, of course, and very importantly, he is credited with instigating the quality revolution. So everything we talk about today is going to be about the quality revolution as it differentiates from the hierarchical thinking of the past. It should also be noted that people think enough of Deming that an institute has been created in his name, the W. Edwards Deming Institute. And as you can see here, there's a website uh, where, where you can get download content, videos. Uh, they have an annual conference so that people can come together and uh, present papers and discuss his ideas. Quite an honor. So now we get to the good part. This uh, slide uh, illustrates uh, Deming's thinking in a very simple way. I've thought about this philosophy enough and read enough about it uh, and I think that it's important to understand for students to understand what his philosophy was versus what it's not. And so first we have to understand uh, general systems theory. I mentioned this earlier. General systems theory is simply input processes or throughput and output. Of course there's also a feedback loop and the feedback loop can be very complex. It can contain multiple uh, layers of loops. We may call this single loop, double loop, triple loop, whatever you want. Um, but that's beyond our, our scope right now. For, for now, it's important to understand general systems theory as inputs, processes, and outputs, or inputs, throughput, and output. So we talked about the hierarchical philosophy. And I'll, I'll d d dig more into that. But the hierarchical philosophy means that we care about results. We care about output. Uh, we care about the consequences. We care about winning and losing, grades, return on investment, anything that's a visible outward number or result, championships. Of course we care about these things. You want, a, you want an A in this course. Every student wants an A. Every student, every, every player and every coach wants to win all the time. And so there are books about this. There are books on results-oriented management. Uh, they, they, you know, there are many books on results-oriented management, how to achieve, how to be successful, and that's important. Uh, and, and you know, the hierarchical philosophy says that we should all be on the same page with this. We, all, we should always want to win, and, and the people at the top are older, they're senior, they're experienced, and they have wisdom, and they know better, and you can listen to them and listen to their what they have to say. And this is fine. It works in a lot of situations, but not all situations, uh, especially as things are changing. Things are changing with customers. Things are changing with technology. With technology, information technology, things are changing so rapidly that what's really missing in the hierarchical view is that uh, there's it, a lot of knowledge and information at, at the bottom of the organization that should be shared, uh, uh, you know, to, to managers. And so managers need to uh, be aware of very subtle things like price differences. Something as small as, uh, the, the, you know, the, the price of alcohol in a, in a, you know, in a department store or um, textiles or toothpaste. And our philosophy regarding that, as well as quality, uh, of, of our products, the, you know, the value that we give our customers. So we need to know more than just, you know, years of experience, having, having years of experience, we need to know current situations. And so we need a lot of information flow going from the bottom to the top of the organization. So it's important to have strong outcomes and results. What Deming said that was so different was that yes, that is important, but what's more important 
and a lot of managers miss this, is that the fact that processes cause positive outcomes. And it's very difficult to get management to shift their minds to thinking about the processes that cause outcomes. Because processes are oftentimes invisible in the organization. We don't, have all, we don't always have visible numbers to depict what our processes are. And he said, we probably should try to do that. We need to know how many errors are being uh, put into our carpet by a production facility. We need to know how, many, you know, how often we're turning off our customers. Uh, what processes are not user friendly for our customers? So all this about user friendliness uh, and and satisfaction, user satisfaction, customer satisfaction, all this about um, errors in in our production facility. These are things that previously had been invisible. And Deming said, let's quantify these processes, and because these processes are what cause positive outcomes. It's very difficult to get people to shift their mindset from a hierarchical to a quality philosophy. And we can, we can learn uh, about the quality philosophy and focusing on processes. But you go out in the world, and there you go. You have these books on results only. You have, what do you have? You look on Financial News Network, and you have tickers showing uh, results. You know, what happened today in the stock market? Uh, stock values went up or down. It's a results-oriented world. That's what people can consume easily and understand very easily. A team won a game or they won a championship and everybody's celebrating that team. But what's missing is, is oftentimes the you know processes that cause that championship. Deming says that if we understand those uh, processes and we build those up, then we can win a championship. We can go beyond that. We can win multiple championships. We can get on top and stay there. So his discussion was about staying power. So results are important, but to get on top and stay on top, we need quality processes. So I mentioned earlier uh, Deming's system of profound knowledge. The fishbone diagram helps depict this very well. If you want to understand a problem for the sake of solving problems, if you want to understand this very well, then you need to understand the fishbone diagram. And what this means is that you have a problem to be solved. And let's say this problem is your grade. So you want an A in the class. You can want an A all you want. Everybody wants an A. Some people extremely want an A. But if they don't understand how to get the A, then they're, they're not going to have a reliable, uh, comfortable time at attaining that, that uh, goal. <clears throat> so you have a main, uh, if, if you look at the fishbone diagram, you have a main um concern of getting an A in the class. As you see this line that goes straight through the middle from left to right, that is your major problem to be solved. There are also lines that go into this main backbone uh, or the problem to be solved. And we have these main causes. We have main cause, main cause A, uh, you know, you can have main cause B and C. So uh, these main causes can be something like reading your textbook. It can be listening to lectures. It can be getting your rest and nutrition, finding a, a place to focus so you can listen and without distractions. So these main causes are, you know, something that, that you as a as the manager of your study processes can, can define. And main causes are made up of level one causes. Uh, so reading your textbook may be as simple as having your highlighter and using your highlighter effectively. You know, that's important. If you highlight everything, then you've not highlighted anything. So uh, being conscientious of that, uh, note taking, some people are better note takers than others, uh, making sure you cover all the material. And then you have level two causes as well, which may go into greater detail, such as making sure you have sharpened pencils. Uh, you know, so, so it just makes a lot of sense that you are drilling down into the more specific areas. And a lot of small things will build up to these larger things. You hear this a lot of times where, uh, the, you know, we, we're more successful if we fo focus on details. So the fishbone diagram is a wonderful way of uh, diagramming problems. And it's, it shows you that the causes are absolutely critical. And if we understand them very well, 
then we have a better chance at not only succeeding, but getting on top and staying there. So I've told you about Deming's quality philosophy. I really need to validate it. Uh, so I would do that by sharing with you a real world example. Deming was uh, interested uh, in expanding his consulting and thought he had something to say. And he went to Ford and he said, look, I can help you. And at the time, if you, if you look into history, we had just created after World War II, uh, we just created the interstate highway system. And so people were, you know, these, these manufacturing companies in the U.S. were selling all kinds of cars. Uh, they also had uh, the pleasure of having all the uh, manufacturing uh, employees that they needed because we'd, we'd ramped up in, in, uh, manufacturing so much in World War II, manufacturing airplanes and tanks and everything. So Ford said, you know, we've got plenty of demand. We have everything we need. No thanks. And, okay, so... Uh, Japan, on the other hand, was in great need, and so Deming went over to Japan, and they actually listened to him. And so if you go back in the, the history of business uh, literature, you'll see uh, that Japan made huge inroads in electronics, uh, you know, motorcycles, starting with smaller uh, dirt bikes and, and then to street bikes. And Japan was able to sell really high-quality products in the U.S., for a lower price, uh, and this was uh, perplexing uh, to the Americans in a lot of ways, and such that the Japanese were accused of dumping, in other words, uh, selling products in the U.S. at a loss. Well, in reality, when you look un underneath, there, there was a great explanation for this. So this this is a good example uh, of the Ford uh, Motor Company transmission. So for years, Ford had been going along selling automobiles, and there's always an aftermarket for their parts, including the transmission. Well, uh, Ford stopped selling these transmissions, these aftermarket transmissions. They could not even sell them to their own dealers. So someone in Ford, the engineers decided to uh, go and look at what was going on. They, they were buying the Japanese transmissions instead. So let's, you know, why is this happening? Well, the, the dealers said that the Japanese transmissions cost less than they were of higher quality. How is this possible? So they broke open a, a Japanese transmission. They did the same with the American transmission. They inspected them. And they noticed something interesting that the both transmissions met the minimum specifications defined by Ford. So you had your minimum threshold, your minimum measurements for the different aspects, the different measurements of the transmission, and both met the minimum. But where they were different was that the Japanese had optimized. They made parts tighter. They were concerned more with materials. They had engineered and re-engineered and re-engineered and re-engineered and kept going, making the transmission meet the, the, uh, the specifications, but also getting better and better and better. And that was the difference. So what Ford learned, learned from this is that the Japanese um, had not only um, you know, made a better product, but in order to accomplish this, this they must have also re-engineered their manufacturing processes. So the quality revolution is not just about rethinking products, it's also about rethinking manufacturing processes. And so it was a great lesson for Ford. And so they adapted and they developed a quality a philosophy of their own. And uh, the rest is history. I think every ma automobile manufacturer in the world has adopted a quality philosophy uh, where you're, get, you're gathering knowledge all the time and trying to embed that in your products and always improving them at all times. And the consumers have won in this way. And as you improve manufacturing processes, you lower costs. And so that's how... Uh, products are able to sold at a higher value for a lower price. So Japan was not dumping. They were simply investing in a quality philosophy. So a great lesson learned by Ford, um, and, and Ford has never been bailed out. And uh, so it's uh, it got to be very uncomfortable at one time, but uh, it, Ford actually has survived that and thrived afterwards. To let you, you know, give another anecdote about how um, automobile manufacturers uh, engage in quality, Toyota is known as a very substantial 
company, automobile manufacturer. I think it's now the largest in the world in terms of unit sales. But uh, Toyota, uh, it, it became one number one at one point. But Toyota once had commercials in the U.S. and they were asking people to go online to their website and provide them with ideas and information about how to improve their products. I mean, that was a direct attempt to gain knowledge and understanding from customers in any place, anywhere, anytime to help improve their products. A very smart strategy and Toyota spent a lot of money to do that. Another way to validate um, Deming's views on philosophy is to look in another uh, arena other than uh, business. Uh, I think we can see this very clearly in the um, teachings of John Wooden. John Wooden uh, is, is considered a philosophical contemporary of Deming, and what that means is he had the same kind of philosophy, but he lived at the same time. So let's study John Wooden. This slide overviews some of the career achievements of John Wooden. Wooden not only was a great basketball player, but he was a great coach. He's the only man ever enshrined in the College Basketball Hall of Fame as both player and coach. He's uh, best known, however, as uh, being a coach. He won uh, in 27 out of 27 consecutive seasons at UCLA. In his last 12 years there, he had 10 national championships, and seven of these were in a row. He also held the world record for consecutive wins by a coach in any sport for 43 years. He won 88 consecutive, consecutive games at one time. And so this tells you how substantial UConn's uh, record was in 2017. It was Wooden's record that they broke. And this is a record that's not just in basketball. It's in any sport. So he won a tremendous number of games as a coach. Also a great player, that should be noted as well. And like Deming, Wooden wrote books. If you are in the coaching community, you have to understand Wooden. Uh, you have to understand his books, uh, or else people will think that you're odd. If you, any coach out there should have read John Wooden's books. Uh, and so they understand his philosophy, but again, the quality philosophy is very painstaking and difficult to fully implement. So here are some of his key teachings, and this may sound, sound familiar to you uh, as we had described the quality philosophy. He says that peaks create valleys. So in other words, if you think winning a game is something to be excited about, you know, it is, but you have to also use a win, just like a loss, to get better. And so he's saying that, and you, know, you can think of general systems theory, um, you know, what goes up must come down. So you can't get too excited. Um, so a few years ago, MSU women's basketball actually beat UConn uh, in the Final Four, and we were so excited about that. It broke UConn's 111-game winning streak, and of course, that was that's the all-time record for wins in any sport. So proud to say MSU, you know, defeated them. However, they lost the next game, and so with all the excitement uh, of beating UConn, uh, it probably took a lot of energy out of our team. They probably I, I would be it would be difficult for me to sleep after beating UConn um, he also says develop yourself don't worry about op opponents this is interesting because you hear about all the scouting that's done about opponents and he said he really didn't scout much he said he probably scouted less than anybody in the country he wanted to develop his own team and what he did with his own team was he made them extremely conditioned and they ran a full court press if you know much about basketball and he used a lot of his bench and he wore out opponents and it was always about fundamentals and how they do things and how do you shoot a properly shoot a basketball uh, he was so focused on developing his players that when they were freshmen the first talk he had with them he explained to them how to put their socks on he might say well how is that related to quality well he ran a full court press he had to have highly conditioned athletes so if they had blisters, they couldn't condition the way he needed them to. He could not take a chance on them having blisters. So he told them exactly how to put their socks on. So that's the kind of detail, if you think about the fishbone diagram, that's the kind of detail that is necessary to truly build a great organization with great sustainability. He also says there's no pillow as soft as a clear conscience. And so what that means is he cannot honestly tell with his players if they were giving a full effort. He can't, uh, uh, you know, 
check on them when they're sleeping. He doesn't know how much water they're drinking. He doesn't know about their nutrition exactly. And in the game, some players look like they're not trying very hard, and he, he doesn't know how much they're training in the off season. Only uh, the individual player knows if they are giving their full, full effort. So this is why he says, no pillow is soft as a clear conscience. You have a clear conscience when you know you're giving your best. He also says, why do so many people dread adversity when it is only through adversity that we grow stronger? He's saying these negative situations that happen to a team can build character and uh, it helps the team focus, actually. And uh, so if you look in sports history, there are many uh, uh, companies that went through or many uh, teams that went through adversity and they won championships. Uh, you know, players will get in trouble for drugs or maybe arrested for shooting someone or there's this big thing hanging over the team and they end up winning the Super Bowl or a World Series. Uh, throughout history, there's there's several, there are many examples of that. So if you want to learn more about Wooden's philosophies, uh, you can uh, go buy his books. It's, it's uh, fascinating. He also has uh, a framework. Coincidentally, guess what this framework is in the shape of? It's a pyramid. It's John Wooden's Pyramid of Success that you can look up. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that uh, a pyramid is usually a symbol of hierarchy, but that's not really how he did it. He, he was always learning from his players and from every situation. Um, so in this pyramid of success that you can learn about later, that's not on your test, by the way, are ideas such as poise, skill, initiative, industriousness, uh, ambitious, uh, ambitiousness, uh, adaptability, uh, fight, faith, patience, integrity, a lot of great lessons for any uh, person. Uh, so I invite you to go look at that. So let's look at some more philosophies of Wooden and see how they relate to the Quality Revolution. Here's a picture of Wooden with Bill Walton, uh, one of the uh, most capable players that he has ever had. Uh, Walton had foot injuries as a pro. He was a great pro as well, but probably a, certainly a much greater college player. Walton is an announcer today, and you'll hear him refer to Wooden oftentimes. And interestingly, Wooden is very much so beloved by his players. He would always uh, oftentimes share with them uh, some quotes from literature or for poetry. So really interesting character is this uh, Wooden guy. I hope you study more about him. He says that the main ingredient of stardom is the rest of the team. And that's interesting. He says that, you know, you, you have a great team and you win. And guess what? People start noticing your individual players. If you had a great player on a losing team, people are not going to notice. Uh, and that was very simple for him. So if you want to be a star, focus on the rest of the team. He also talks about the difference between credit and character. Credit is an outward thing. Character is what we are uh, from within. And, uh, you know, you may know people who always want credit for things all the time. And, you know, what's hidden there is the character. That person may or may not be a great person uh, despite their outward uh, results. And so we can see this uh, in a team. A team may win a game, uh, but they may lose the next one. Uh, a team that's concerned about its uh, inner workings, its character, uh, has more sustainability. Um, he also talks about character versus reputation. He says that uh, if you don't care about who gets the credit, then uh, you, you've got a good thing there. You've got a good team makeup. So this brings us to really the pinnacle of this discussion. This is the organizational learning model that you will be tested on. You'll have about five questions on this. This is probably going to be about 10% of your grade. You need to understand this diagram. And what I would do if I were you is I would be able to draw it. I would take a sheet of paper and I would try to draw this diagram without looking at this slide and you're going to draw it incorrectly, I would draw it again and draw it again until you can draw it correctly so you know the diagram. It's a diagram that I think every student should know in business. It describes exactly how to go through the steps of organizational learning. And as you see at the bottom here, where it says technology, it's a very broad term, you have this arrow on the left, bottom left side of this diagram is, is inputs. And these circles, the three circles that you see, these are processes. And we, we, you know, what's this sound like? This is general systems theory. And the, the arrow underneath uh, knowledge acquisition that's going out to the right, that is outcomes. So we have inputs, processes, and outputs at the very bottom. 
And what you see with these th two loops here, the single loop and double loop learning, those two loops, that's the feedback loop. And as I told you earlier, those loops can be very complex. We can keep going. We can have three or four or five loops. I think that would be beating a dead horse. So let's just talk about these two loops. Single loop learning involves knowledge acquisition, decision making, and incremental change. So what we do in a learning organization is we collect knowledge from the operations. And it's a, an important process known as knowledge acquisition. And that inf knowledge is used in decision making. And then decision making can result in one of two things. It can be incremental change or radical change. So there are two outcomes of a decision of a decision. Radical change would be top down driven. Incremental would be bottom up. They're, they're very different from one another. And we'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute. But decision making also involves standards, as you see in the top right of the diagram. So a decision is based on what our standards are and the knowledge that we acquire. So what are these standards? This, you know, standard could be plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean in uh, a quality uh, context. A standard could be we don't cuss around our customers. Okay, so we have an employee who is cussing in front of our customers, is making us look bad, and cussing in front of the children. That goes against our behavioral standards. Okay, so we have a spill. Don't let it sit there for two and a half hours. Clean it up immediately. This goes against our standards. We have standards in this organization. As you collect knowledge about the current operations, we adhere to our standards and we behave accordingly. Incremental change is a pre-programmed change about something that commonly happens. As you can see from the far right, single loop learning happens 97% of the time. We, 97% of the time in an organization, we acquire knowledge, we make decisions based on that knowledge and standards, and we make an incremental change. It's pre-programmed. It's something that's normal. It's something our employees are accustomed to doing. And we make increment. This is quality. This is a quality philosophy. So that's why we have TQM there, total quality management. And this is a quality way of going about business. And we need to do this. We need to incrementally change throughout the life of the organization, or else we will get into a situation where we are not fitting our environment. If we don't do a good job of this single loop learning, we will eventually become a misfit with our environment. And we may be threatened, let's say the coronavirus happens or something, and we all of a sudden, we're losing a tremendous amount of money. That's a little bit different. Usually it's something like an economic downturn or something. Uh, the coronavirus has just really wiped everybody out. So it's not really a good normal example. It's uh, quite an anomaly. Uh, but let's say unemployment rate's going up. Uh, let's say inflation's going up. Or let's say customer demand is shifting. All of those forces that we talked about in the past, technology's shifting. All of a sudden, we're obsolete. So now we need to make a radical change. We're about to lose a trillion dollars in a quarter. Or let's, let's go with a billion. We're going to lose a billion dollars in a quarter. So we need to make a radical change. We change our ideals. Now we have to change our ideals. We've changed our worldview. Okay. So instead of producing large gas guzzlers, we need to make a radical adaptation to our everything. We're going to, we are going to produce uh, fuel efficient, smaller, compact automobiles. This has actually been done in the past uh, when when uh, GM was bailed out and Chrysler was bailed out by the federal government. They had built the wrong product for the times. Gas prices shifted, and so uh, you know people like you know, larger automobiles, but they don't want to pay three or four dollars a gallon for gas. So the ideals. Um, are, uh, you know, how, how we view the world. It's a very general term. Ideals affect our standards. Our standards are more defined, uh, you know, metrics, perhaps, or it's defined in terms of words, and we report this throughout the organization. So these are, this is the, this is, these are the components of a learning organization. And you see from this, this organization is ready to incrementally change and radically change which is very different from a lot of uh, organizations today. Uh, this puts the onus on the organization that it needs to uh, be able to adapt to its environment. And also individuals can, can use this as well. As you study, if you make an 80 on a test, maybe you need to make an incremental change. 
If you make a 40 on a test, you need to make a radical change to how you're how you are studying. And uh, this quality uh, revolution, you know, when we think this way, makes us explicitly understand better how to uh, adapt and improve. It's a very intelligent thing for us to do as an organization, as an and as an individual. So this concludes our discussion on organizational learning. We will have two more presentations on organizational learning. We will continue this discussion. The reason it's relevant to our, our topic of information systems is because organizations process information. And, and why do we do this? We do this for a reason. We do it to incrementally or radically change. Uh, we are not so focused on outcomes uh, and results such as you know, visible numbers only, such as accounting numbers. Uh, we're interested in how well we do things to cause those accounting numbers to improve, or visible numbers only. Uh, we, we may call this VNO. Um, we don't concern ourselves so much with winning. We concern ourselves with sustaining win winning, and we do this through quality processes, by doing things right. It's important to understand organizational learning because the environment is dynamic. It's changing all the time, and if we are not learning organizations, then we're going to become obsolete and we will lose our business. Uh, technology is changing all the time. Um, so that, that's what instigates a need to understand organizational learning. So we're going to spend a whole lot more time on this topic later on. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you.